Yes, move to English. So, Ed, uh, very pleased, uh, as always, to, to, to be here with, with you and discuss uh, metas. We discuss a bit about uh, Forex, uh, about energy. Yes. Energy is a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, commodity and uh, take a lot of attention from us. As you know, we open a new desk and so uh, we, we, we can now provide services on the energy, but looking at your forecast uh, on, uh, on I see a very interesting uh, presentation as always. And, uh, and so I want to, you to, sure. to introduce sure. your speech. If you, uh, no, if you prefer sure. to, to stand up or, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I will stand yeah. because yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. I'm not here. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes, great. Uh, well, Luca, Paolo, thank you very much, first of all, to invite me again uh, to this wonderful conference. And so nice to see all of you uh, once more. Um, thank you also to uh, Anna and to uh, Francesca, Silvia, for always making uh, things easy for me. In fact, Francesca and I, we correspond now <laughs> regularly, beautiful emails back and forth. <laughs> She doesn't speak one word of English, and I don't speak one word of Italian, <laughs> but all because of Google Translate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway, uh, go ahead. We'll, uh, uh, I, I just thought I'll show you this chart. I was here about two, uh, May, June, about two months ago. And uh, this is uh, where, where prices were then. And uh, you know we thought things were quite low. And since two months ago, they have dropped uh, anywhere between 15 to 26 percent on all the base metals. Oil is up uh, 8 percent. The S&P has dropped 16 percent. So it's really a nasty picture out there. And as Andrea said, showed us in his charts, everything is moving down except for the commodity markets. And even commodities are now starting to come down. So you know, you can't have a bull market in commodities when you are going into recession. It's hard to imagine it. So uh, I'm not saying we are, but this is the feeling right now. Um, why, why have we dropped so much? Uh, recession talk, uh, I mean, everybody is lowering their forecasts, the IMF, World Bank, International Finance Institute, all the economists in the States, you turn on the television, everyone is talking about recession. There is even talk we might be in recession now in the United States because last quarter it was negative. This quarter, the forecasts are for zero growth. So if you get a revision to minus 0.1 or 0.2, we're technically in a recession. So uh, uh, nobody really knows, even the Fed, it doesn't really know, and that's what makes this whole thing very kind of uncertain, and people are getting ahead of it by selling. They don't want to be long in this kind of uncertain environment, which is why all the funds have turned short, as Andrea's sh uh, chart showed us. Uh, oil prices are still high. It's a negative. Uh, interest rates are still too low. You know, our rates are 3% in the United States, and the inflation rate is 8.5%. In Europe, inflation, I, I think, is about 6%, something like that, Eurozone, right? Interest rates are <laughs> not even 1%. So uh, actually, the one country doing the best is Brazil. Their inflation is 13%, and their interest rates are 13%. So that's why the real is going up so much. Uh, anyway, the other problem, China. I think China was a big reason we had deflation for many years. And now that they are not recovering, I think they're contributing to the inflation problem because they are not shipping their goods quickly enough. So you have shortages of, of everything because they, they are still not uh, running at 100% because of this COVID policies. And lastly, another reason we have been down is the metal deficits that everybody thought would happen at the beginning of the year. They're not happening. And you will see this in uh, the next slide. Uh, I, I showed you this slide last time. This is the size of the different markets, aluminum, copper, nickel, etc. 
this is the contribution of Russia. Uh, and as you can see, the Russian contribution in metals are anywhere between five to 10%. So it, this was a huge amount of Russian units that was supposed to be somehow out of the market because of not sanctions on the metals, but sanctions on shipping, banking, uh, et cetera. So we thought there would be, if you go to the next slide, we thought there would be big deficits uh, after the invasion. So we thought, I thought, uh, if you look at this column, aluminum could be in about a four, three to three and a half million ton deficit. Same with copper, 100 to 600,000 ton deficit. Nickel, about a uh, deficit from uh, a surplus. These were the pre-invasion estimates. These are the Russian, that's the Russian contribution. And those are what, what I thought would be the new uh, supply demand balances. Instead, nothing, nothing is happening like that. Aluminum right now, people are talking about only a 1 million ton deficit. Copper is supposed to be in surplus. Uh, nickel is supposed to be in surplus, lead surplus. Uh, zinc, a slight deficit. Uh, oil, uh, the Russians are still exporting oil, so that doesn't seem to be hitting the market either. So th this, I think, has been a big reason why the metals have dropped. The Russian contribution has not been that uh, severe on the markets. Uh, we talked about oil. I mean, look at this chart on oil uh, uh, exports. It's hardly changed much, uh, and it's supposed to be sanctioned. Um, you know, it's going to uh, places like India. I heard, I was speaking to an Indian consumer. Uh, he told me that uh, Russian oil is trading at a $34 discount to the benchmark. Uh, just to move it. Th those are the types of discounts that we're seeing in oil. I don't think we are seeing the same type of discounts in Russian metal because that seems to be moving nicely. Uh, not so nicely, but moving. And they're not giving away such big discounts. But in oil, they are. This was a good chart <coughs> that I thought uh, oil in dollars... It, we're still below the highs, uh, record highs, but in euros and pounds, we are at record highs. So European and British consumers are getting hit by the currency and by the high prices. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I always am curious, why are the Chinese so uh, serious, why are they so insistent on this COVID policy, which doesn't make any sense to me. You know, there's 10 cases somewhere and they close the whole town down. And I, I just thought some of the reasons why. First of all, the government thinks that if they open everything up, they'll lose about one and a half million people to COVID, which may not be a lot for China, but probably for the government, uh, it's quite a bit. So I think that's one reason. Uh, they're also hoping that they can counteract the COVID by stimulus. So although they're locking everything down, they're trying to stimulate the economy. Not very successfully, but that's their game plan. Another reason is their vaccines are not very effective. So, uh, but they don't want to ask the Europeans or the Americans for vaccines because that's admission of failure, that their vaccines don't work. But their vaccines really are not very good from what we hear. And of course, dictatorship. When you have one person making the decisions, nobody will say no to him. And Xi is now in charge. He wants the COVID campaign to continue. His prime minister, Premier Li, doesn't really like the policy, but he's on his way out. He'll be resigning, he'll be leaving end of the year. Um, so what will happen in China with this COVID? If it doesn't change, you're going to have a stop go in the economy. It starts for a month or two, then COVID breaks, they lock it down, it stops again. It's not going to be very consistent. And this is a problem for everybody because we really need China to get on board 
so we can start to grow again uh, uh, and help uh, help the world economy in terms of demand. But they're not doing it, and I can understand it, but maybe these are some of the reasons. Uh, I think the real estate market in China is just as worrying as the COVID situation. I, I brought this slide last time. 20% of the global steel and copper consumption goes into Chinese real estate, not into Chinese economy, just the real estate. 9% into uh, of uh, global aluminum demand, five to 8% of zinc and nickel demand all goes into real estate. Uh, and it's really just a disaster what's going on there. I mentioned this last time, Evergrande, they have uh, 300 billion in debt, 1.4 million unfinished apartments in 1,300 projects spread across 280 Chinese cities. This is all that what they owe, and they are struggling to get the equipment, the equity, the financing to get these projects off the ground. This is a lot of metal that is not going to be used if these uh, apartments aren't delivered. And the government isn't doing anything to help. You know, uh, they should be merging some of these companies. They should be moving some of them into bankruptcy. They should be uh, probably giving some of them equity in return, uh, financing in return for equity. But the government is not doing any of that. They are just standing back and lowering the rates, lowering the mortgage requirements, all very superficial things. And if you see in the next chart, uh, it hasn't helped much. Ho home sales in China continue to decline. That was the March number. April is also bad. If you go to the next slide, Anna, uh, property, residential sales, property starts, property completion still going down. And uh, there's really no bottom in it. And uh, sales by the top uh, developers in China, still uh, a, lo a lot of red ink. So this isn't a big news story, but I think if you want to find out why metals are struggling, this has been going on for some time now. Now, uh, because Chinese demand is weak for metals, I think we're starting to see their exports pick up. And this is something uh, Andrea also pointed out. So if you go to the next slide, uh, primary aluminum production, it's at record highs. This goes to April. The May numbers just came out last week. Uh, the steel output is increasing. Zinc is also increasing. They're, they're starting to export more and more of these metals because their local market is not taking it off. <clears throat> Just some thoughts on what's going on. Uh, from what we're hearing, some of the shipping and the chip shortages are improving slightly. Uh, Chinese exports are also coming back, not to the full extent, but they are coming back. Uh, are they going to rethink their COVID strategy? It remains to be seen. So far, there's no indication of that. The Ukraine situation, I think if you get a ceasefire announcement, that would be very bullish for all the markets, but it doesn't look like it. I think this will be like a long, long war. It will just continue and continue, uh, unfortunately, for, for, the, for Ukraine. Interest rates in the US, um, I think you know we are close to getting to a top. I think the Federal Reserve is slowing the economy down. We might have another rate hike in, in July. The Fed does not meet in August. The next meeting after that is in September. Maybe in September they will announce a pause. Uh, uh, but right now they're still behind. The inflation is 8%, and they're at 1.5%, 3% on the treasuries. They're still, they still need to increase the rates a bit more to get inflation under control. Um, so I think metal prices, you know, as you did in your survey, I think they'll continue to be sideways to down for the balance of the year. I don't have any numbers per se. You, you did a great job showing where the uh, projections are by probability. 
but I think sideways to down for a little while longer. Um, by the way, this inflation rate in the United States, uh, right now it's around 8%, but keep, keep in mind it's 8% because we are comparing this number to a year ago. So uh, as, as this curve moves sideways, the year over year comparisons will drop. You know, it's not going to continue like this. So, you know, keep that in mind. You know, four months or six months from now, whatever the inflation rate is will be compared to a higher inflation rate from a year ago. So the overall rate will be a bit lower. And I think that's, that's being lost right now in the whole explanation. Everybody thinks we're going to continue 10, 12 percent uh, inflation a year. At some point, it will start to level off, and I think it will be maybe by year end. Um, I think Sadun talked about uh, the recession in the United States. I don't know if it will be very, very severe or strong because the American consumer and the European consumer is in better shape than they were before. In the United States, there is a lot of equity in the, in the home prices. Uh, there is a lot of savings, as you can see on that chart. Um, so I think that will give consumers a bit of a cushion. And if you look at the next chart, um, gas prices, this is all you hear, gas, gas prices. But you know, if you look at the gas price as a percentage of American income, it's still not that high. It's maybe 3%, 3 whereas in 1970, it was 6%. Same thing for food. Food prices are going up, but as a percentage of income, it's not as severe as it used to be. Now, in these poor countries, it's a different story. And I, I feel for them, you know, in Egypt, in uh, India, places like that, they are really suffering both from food and high energy prices. But in Europe and the United States, I think we can sustain these prices for a little while longer. Um, again, this is more charts on the American consumer, their household uh, debt, and their debt is low. On the right-hand side, you'll see their debt levels. They're not up to here in debt like they were in 2008. So I think that means we should have a fairly mild recession. If anything, Europe will probably go into recession first. They'll go into recession first and maybe the US later. Uh, despite sort of the negative picture, you still, I, you can't get too bearish on these metals because mining is becoming very difficult now. Production, manufacturing, smelting, uh, as I was talking to Massimo earlier, you know, more and more pressure to become greener, more environmentally friendly uh, in, in uh, key countries, uh, Peru, Chile, Colombia. Uh, governments are moving to the left. They want to minimize the contribution of oil and mining. They want uh, the unions to have more say. They want, the governments want to take more of the profits for the country. Uh, and the mining companies themselves, they are not really expanding production that much. Rio Tinto made $17 billion last year. $15 billion went to dividends and share buybacks. It didn't go into mines or expansion. So they are not helping their own cause either. And uh, as I mentioned, green, going green uh, has a cost, you know. Uh, uh, you can't really go green with just solar or just wind or just scrap, you know. There has to be higher costs uh, involved in the whole supply chain. And I think that will keep prices from collapsing to where we were in 2015, 16, where we saw four and a half thousand dollars on copper and 1300 on uh, aluminum and 1500 on zinc. I think those days are, are probably behind us. And stocks, next slide, Anna. The stocks are very low. Funny enough, the stocks don't seem to, nobody cares about the stocks. There's no zinc stocks, there's no copper stocks. 
but yet uh, prices continue to fall. I think people have said, this is the way it is. There'll be no stocks. Uh, we just have to live with it. And uh, maybe the stocks will start to build as we get into a recession, stocks could start to build again, but so far we're not seeing it. Uh, Harbor Aluminum, for those of you who uh, have heard of them, they think there is 16 million tons of aluminum stock off exchange, off warrant. That's an amazingly high number. I, I don't agree with it, but they think there is a lot of scrap, which is why they've been so bearish on aluminum. Uh, they think prices will get to around $2,300 by the end of the year. I think they've been right, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Uh, I just threw in some charts you, you all uh, have seen. Uh, I mean, since I put these in, we've dropped again. The copper surplus, surprisingly, is going to be 140,000 tons this year. It means Russian metal doesn't seem to be impacting it. I'm curious from the audience, after I finish, my, the question I have for you is, do you think there will be sanctions on Russian metal like there would be on on gas and on and crude oil uh, and other commodities, um, will the EU impose finally formal sanctions on on the Russians? I, I'm curious what you have to say about that. I talked to one uh, Swedish consumer and and he said if they do something like that, Europe's manufacturing will come to a halt because we really can't replace uh, uh, aluminum uh, just going out in the market. I don't know if that's true, but I'm, I'm curious why the Europeans have not moved yet on, on the metals. So maybe after I finish, uh, I'd love to hear what your thought is. Uh, aluminum, aluminum, I thought, is, has been really quite weak. Uh, like I said earlier, the, deficit, the market is supposed to be in a one million ton deficit even less than it was at the beginning of the year. Uh, CRU has the market in a surplus this quarter, which is quite uh, amazing. And uh, China demand, again, very weak. And I think that's been contributing to the, uh, the sell-off, as has their extra exports. Uh, zinc, we talked about it earlier. The Chinese are exporting about 5,000 tons a month of zinc right now. Last year, 500 tons a month. So they, they don't have the local market. Uh, autos are down. Construction demand is down. In fact, automobile sales in China, in Shanghai in April, were zero. Not one car was sold in Shanghai all of April, which is quite remarkable. Um, nickel, nickel, I think, is becoming a two-tier market, the class one and the class two. The class one, which is, goes into EVs, is still very strong. The class two in stainless is weaker, uh, more of a surplus in uh, class two. Um, uh, but both markets are, don't seem to have a problem right now with, with nickel. For what it's worth, Goldman sees a surplus in nickel of class two. Uh, they see a deficit, I think, in class one of about 200,000 tons, 100,000 ton surplus in class two. And of course, you have to also point out what their forecast is. They're looking at 42,000 for nickel next year, which uh, I, I don't think will, will make it. But nickel is a whole story by itself. I won't go into more detail on it. But I think from what I can see, it's becoming a two-tier market. And nickel itself for the EV battery may not even be needed. Uh, you know, they might be working with intermediates to uh, make these batteries. You may not even need as much class one as people thought. Um, that's it. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>